My name is Tina Kempt. I'm the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. I am really happy to have you all here. Thank you. <laughs> We are very excited about this year's conference, and I think it's no underestimation to say that last night we kicked it off with an amazing performance and an incredible conversation around the installation uh, that is around the corner in the Tunnel Gallery. Um, please take the time to go and see it. It is a weaving and quilt exhibition um, by Martha Friedman and Vera P. Hall. Um, and so you can find it literally by going straight down the hallway till you see a yellow um, hall, a yellow hallway, a wall, and it goes all the way down. It is spectacular. Um, I need to begin with a few announcements, um, but first with a few thanks. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, the thanks really go to the people who make this conference possible every year. Um, those people are the staff of, of BCRW, the Barnard Center for Research on Women, Avi Cummings, Pam Phillips, Hope Dector, Che Gossett, and Tammy Navarro. They are truly the most amazing people I've ever worked with, and they're in this room. Please thank them with me. <laughs> You will also experience the hospitality and support of our uh, student, researcher, student research assistants. That table of lovely people right there, please thank them as well. <laughs> And finally, there are two people who have really gone above and beyond the call of duty over the course of the last few weeks in making this possible. Those are the folks from facilities and events management, in particular Elizabeth Lula and Amanda Gates Elston, who have made this performance, have made the, the um, installation, have made all of these things happen, and we are eternally grateful to them, so please acknowledge them for the work that they put into this. Uh, we. My co-organizer, Nancy Mormon, and I would like to just really welcome you to this 42nd annual conference, 42nd year in, 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 in sequence of the annual Scholar and Feminist Conference, which this year focuses, as you know, on the topic of haptics. We have gathered our pick of the most creative and innovative artists and scholars working on the body, touch, and its multi-century extensions. At a moment when challenging and indeed activist approach to such topics couldn't be more pressing. The new political era that we've entered has set its sights on the bodies of some of our most vulnerable communities. And recent executive orders have made it more urgent than ever to be accountable to those around us who find themselves isolated or menaced by this new regime. So in, this, in, uh, in so many cultures and so many periods, including this new aggressively nationalist one, and that's a nice word for it. Embodiment itself is both racialized and feminized, such that female especially serves as a universal signifier of the body's materialities, limitations, insults, and weaknesses. While recent decades have witnessed an explosion of scholarly and more general interest in, in embodiment and bodies of all sorts, particularly in relation to issues of power, knowledge, and identity, academics and cultural critics alike often avoided questions about the body's sensory and affective engagements. Uh, the more intimate senses, those necessarily closer to the body itself, have traditionally also been conceived of as more lowly and thus more feminized and racialized. Until now, that is. <laughs> Now we are witnessing an explosion of interest in and focus on other senses, um, especially touch, but touch as a uniquely whole body and combin com combinatory sense. Um, and with this new awareness comes a frankly political awareness of the capacities of embodiment and the senses in ways that expand our facility for being in the world and our accountability to one another and to other species with whom we share the planet and our environment. The work of our presenters at this year's Scholar and Feminist Conference offer us a rich opportunity to think politically about some of the most compelling engagements of embodied practices of touch, situatedness, sensation, and performance taken up by feminist scholars, artists, and activists. 
We hope that you will take advantage, full advantage, of the multiplicity of ways they challenge us not simply to listen and respond, but to interact, to be stimulated, moved, or affected by their work and the political implications of their interventions. We invite you to immerse yourselves in the sights, sounds, smells, and performances of the variety of embodied practices they engage, enact, and describe. And we hope that by the end of the day, you will take away your own insights into the powerful possibilities of embodiment and sensation. OK, so one more thing. Because we're professors, we like footnotes. <laughs> And I'm a professor of classics here at Barnard, as well as comparative literature and affiliated with women, gender, and sexuality studies. And those things, you, if you pull them all together, it makes um, uh, hapt the word haptic very resonant because the Greek side of it is that, that it comes from uh, the verb hapto, which doesn't just mean to touch, but also means to grasp, um, attach to, even kindle, set alight. It's, so it's a very active and, and um, capacious word. And it, as such, I think it encourages an approach to the senses that, that is multi-sensory, right, rather than isolating one, one sense at a time. And so it encourages a way of thinking about embodiment and the senses in that um, uh, embracing multi-sensory manner. And that's what we're promoting today. So thank you so much. Our, our, our main artist of this panel is Joseli Carvalho, um, who is a Br Brazilian multimedia artist living in Rio de Janeiro and New York City. Over the past four decades, she has assembled a body of work in a wide range of media that gives eloquent voice to matters of memory, identity, and social justice, while consistently challenging the boundaries between artist and audience, and between politics and art. She is the recipient of many prestigious grants and has taught at the School of Architecture, National University of Mexico, and SUNY Purchase. This is Jocelyn. And so, and Alicia Imperiali on the end there is currently a fellow at the Society for the Humanities at Cornell <coughs> University with me, much to my pleasure. <laughs> She's an architect and artist whose visual and scholarly work focuses on the impact of technology on art architecture, representation, and fabrication, including a book called, with a, this great title, New Flatness, Surface Tension in D Digital Architecture, and essays such as Digital Skins, Architecture of Surface. Alex Purvis in the middle here is a, is a um, dear friend of mine and colleague. She's an associate professor of classics at UCLA who writes on archaic and classical Greek literature. Uh, including the forthcoming Homer and Poetics of Gesture, and a collection of essays on haptic sensibilities in antiquity called Touch and the Ancient Senses, which is forthcoming, we worked on together. In 2013, she co-edited with Shane Butler in the same series, Synesthesia and the Ancient Senses, which explores the merging of sensory experiences beyond the discrete categories of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. And so you can see very relevant presence here at our conference. So I give it up to you all. To take it away. Well, can you can you hear me? It's uh, well, I cannot look at you at these glasses. So we may do something completely different. Who knows now? Um, let's keep smelling. So uh, if I do something completely off, it's no problem because you're still smelling, right? Um, well, I'm very thankful to participate in this conference. Its timing could not have been more perfect. It's a gift to be able to contextualize my diary of images and smells which in a haptic envelopment in the moment of my life. Um, my companion and husband of 42 years has flew away on February 8 to airscapes yet unknown to us his last breath unlocked an explosion of affection that entered my body with his last smell. My consciousness of how both art and life affect others and is affected by the world became a new mode of activism. It is within this parameter that I would like to share with you fragments of my open diaries. 
I call my artwork an open diary of images and smells, perhaps a book of loose and intertwined pages, chapters of actuality and virtuality, fragments without a definite beginning or end. The impermanence generates a body of work open to sensations, perceptions, focus, and affections in time and space. My art practice just as poses craftsmanship, ephemerality, hand and digital manipulation. The choice of media follows the needs of the narrative. <laughs> wow, okay. Anyway, it's, we keep on going. I'm never alone in this passage. Birds and turtles are always with me. For the past 40 years, my practice has revolved around searching ways to poetically retrieve and preserve individual and collective memories through a multidisciplinary and sensorial approach. Through my artwork, I have also embraced the violent contradiction of a basic need to be sheltered and the lack of security due to the instability brought by wars, religious conflicts, political uncertainties, social prejudice, and environmental fragility. Smell, the most primitive and forgotten sense, is directly connected to a complex set of structures, the limbic system, where the amygdala is the emotion center of the brain, and the hippocampus is essential in the formation of new memories about past experiences. The hippocampus also acts as a memory indexer by sending memories out to the appropriate part of the brain for long-term storage and retrieving them when necessary. The frontal part of the cingulate gyrus links the smells and sights with pleasant memories of previous emotions, a reason for the association of smells with deep, small emotional visual memories. A memory of a smell was the introduction of olfactory in my artwork in the early 80s. Smell of fish was composed of drawings, book art, installations, and performances as banquets of pleasure, exorcising poetically the stigma that several cultures have placed upon the female genitalia and female desire. And yet, the smell of fish was not present only its memory. At the openings in New York, Sao Paulo, and Havana, we served codfish cakes. The science of olfactory is new. Philosophers like Plato understood the sense of sight as the foundation of reason. The smell for several centuries was seen as the sense of madness and savagery, and yet was present in the daily life of early cultures. For Kant, smell was a crude sense, but he understood that it was the only sense that could not be turned off. We smell with every breath. Therefore, we stop smelling at the moment of our last breath. Death is an experience is strongly associated with odors as the physical body separates from the spiritual body. The former decomposes and the other volatilizes, exhaling the last breath, the last smell, the change of state. Throughout history, rites of death have been impregnated with an olfactory dimension. The interplay of the 
the interplay between life and death is noticed by the molecules of putrescine and cadaverine. They are responsible for the smell of, ro the smell of rotting flesh that accompanies the decomposition of organic material. The same molecules are part of the characteristic odor of semen. In olfactory terms, death and conception are closed linked. Perhaps this vital continuity in death, putrefa putrefaction, rebirth, was perceived in rural cultures, where the odor of excrement was welcome because of its fertilization quality. As we die, the last breath carries the smell of a life that's not there anymore. The, present of, the presence of my dual citizenship has always been presented in the construction of my work, as well as the acknowledgement of the synergy of life and death. After living and working outside of Brazil since 1964, I began in 2007 an imaginary excursion of recognition of my birth country through the forgotten smells of my childhood. The fragile act of construction of a nest became the representation of a need to be sheltered. The nest, the place where the first sense, the sense of smell, meets our basic necessity of protection, a roof over our heads. It started with the photograph of a small bird that in the process of building its nest crashed to its own image reflected on a glass window panel. An act of survival or a suicidal act? I interpret it as a search for an essence a primitive and powerful beginning where the sense of smell is present with its connection to memory. Arquitetando was the initial installation of Nidus Vitrio, glass nest, a large and yet intimate construction of a thousand branches molded with the fragility of glass resin and sculpted with the strength of avian architecture. The sound and the projected texts from a smell memory blog are manipulated algorithmically through a randomized computer program and sequence and time are never repeated. But the most significant aspect of the intimacy of this nest is the smell of nest. Place it inside the nest construction and created with the support of Givaudan do Brasil, who I am working with them since uh, 2009, an innovative company working in the flavors and fragrances industry in Sao Paulo. What could be the smell of a nest? We don't have a vocabulary developed for the sense of smell as we have for the other senses. Also, the physiological links between smell and language centers of the brain are pitifully weak. With a reduced olfactory vocabulary, we need to use metaphors and associations to describe it. Smells are very personal and may bring different memories to different people. For me, the smell of nest is a mixture of sour mother's breast milk, dirty diapers, shit, the freshness of the skin of a newborn baby, wet branches, broken twigs, flying feathers, disinfectant, urine, bacteria, mold, wet soil. I have also created three other smells at that occasion for this installation. Uh, hot sun, 
wet earth, and open sea. They are the smells of a collective nest, our planet, and they are experienced through three different dispersers. Contrary to the smell of nest that emanate from the inwards of the nest invading the space. The tree smells are somewhat pleasurable, but they have a kick that let us know what are we doing with our natural world, bringing the attention to the changes that are happening in our environment. As an example, the smell of wet earth contains sulfur. The open sea, civet and escatol. One year later, the installation Nidus Vitrio became an abandoned nest in another space, and lighting was a new medium to be added. Uh, Rudyard Kipling has said that the first condition of understanding a foreign country is to smell. What are the smells that keep the memory of a town? was the question I posed for the three-month residence in Vienna, Espírito Santo, Brazil, in 2012, resulting in an exhibit, Uruku, the Forgotten Disciplines. My intention was to create an olfaction map of the town with three different communities. The perception of smell was interpreted as an identity tool and a way to redefine the relationship with each other and with place. Olfaction became the raw material or essence in the exchange of experiences and the development of strategies of interaction and involvement among different communities living in a town through collective installations as well as my own individual artwork. Book of Smells was the result of my involvement with the community of descendants of runaway slaves, Quilombola, uh, during the residence. After visiting them, eating, smelling, dancing, and spending time with them, I realized that the knowledge of medicinal herbs used by their ancestors and healers was disappearing with the younger generations. Book of Smells consists of an archival changing notebook of medicinal plants squeezed between its pages. A series of 18 inkjet photographs document the changes occur in the herbs during the three months residence. Most of the herbs dry, but some grew again as a result of the humidity in the area. The notebook placed inside the cabinet file drawer emanated the combination of herbal smells changing with time. A herbal garden was built in town for everyone to use. The second site-specific installation was a collective of artwork made up of an open number of empty perfume bottles available to anyone in town to fill with the memory of the smell. At the end, we had 750 uh, perfume bottles. Um, as an ongoing installation, by now I have about a thousand empty perfume bottles today that carry memories from other towns and cities like New York City. The third installation originated for, with my interaction with a group of adolescents living in a housing project. We distribute video cameras for them to document their neighborhood smells. It was the beginning of a series of smell walks in different cities, places, such as New York, through the nose, which you can see through the YouTube. Geography of odors is only possible if we accept that it's transient. It's evanescence, illusion of absence, and it's haptic experience, a part of the challenge in the insertion of olfactory art in a visual sound-oriented contemporary art world. On the main gallery, which was my residence studio, the video installation Uruku, The Forgotten Disciplines, was exhibited. My deep emotional involvement with this residence allowed me to transpose the nest of glass as my own shelter, 
into an open-ended construction made up of 750 branches found in the, in the neighborhoods, found around, and dipped in glue and wrapped in urucum, a fiery red condiment powder from Brazil, originated with the Indians of the region and used today in most dishes of the area. The produced artificial smell of nest was substituted by the natural smell of urucum, said by all that it had no smell, and yet unexpectedly impregnated the branches and the whole exhibit space. I do not produce a handmade paper, but I have had special papers created for specific artworks, such as a series of lithographs, Tracajá, the small turtle in extinction from the Amazon basin, which is my avatar, my surrogate, and the embodiment since early 80s, as well as the main protagonist of my artwork. And, uh, and also the series of disenchanting Salmu, based on the destruction of archaeological sites in Iraq during the war, that is, the destruction of a culture. The precious handmade paper were placed on the floor of the Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo and uh, to be stepped as we have done with their culture. Shards is a scented artist's book followed by installations that brings together artisanal work and nanotechnology. The fragrance inserted into the book have their origin in text by six writers created from the memory of a forgotten smell in shards of my 20-year-old collection of broken wine glasses. They are, the smells are affection, pleasure, emptiness, absence, illusion, and persistence. The book cover exudes the fragrance of glass developed by Nadege Le Garland de Sec, a perfumer at Givaudin, Paris. This, this essence is trapped in volatile molecule, molecules, molecules inside the fibers of the handmade paper that was made up of cigarette butts at the University of Brasilia. This process preserves the scent and ensures that it emanates slowly by touch. This is an example of one of the smells. Actually, you, some of you has had the emptying. And this, this is the text, and I will read uh, my text about uh, the um, smell. Emptiness is smell 157D2. This smell interprets the discomfort of the emptiness of non-existence. It's not just about nothing. It's also about displacement in space. We started from a marine idea as if the waters of the sea created absence. But we wanted to add frustration and achieve it through small hints of animal nerves, such as castorium and civet over the salty tones. Fig brings the unexpected mixture, creating the idea of an impossible place where all the elements do not come together as one. Separation creates heaviness in the void. Uh, about this uh, series of shards, I wrote, one after another, the wine glasses broke, and I kept the pieces without questioning why. I bought several sets of wine glasses so that when they broke by accident, they remained their remains would find shelter in the original cardboard boxes. Very early one morning, I arranged some of the broken goblets on the old black marble fireplace right underneath my self-portrait, upside down. At that moment, I caught an odor of sour breast milk from one of the glasses that initiated this visual smell sound project. It was the beginning of a search for stories to recall to a faint smell emanating from fragments of glass. 
Now I question why I save glass shards. Why keep the cutting sharpness of, sli of slivers? Could it be the need to have at hand a weapon to puncture or dig into my arteries? To have a penetrate instrument whose future function would be to make wrinkled skin bleed into death? Or would these slivers be just a placid refuge of memory? I'm passionate about glass. Its transparency, its fragility, its delineation when cracked, its strength when shattered, the representation of danger, the representation of risk, the deconstruction of endangerment. Intact, wine glasses hide no secrets, but their splinters hold silent confidences. I do not wish the broken glasses to be metaphors for shattered moments of our realities, but rather sleeves of pleasure, grief, joy, pain, perhaps even despair and passion. Is there an existence without enchantment, jealousy, anger, desire, vulnerability? Sculpting the shards into new forms is my present charade. Glass ceiling is a new ongoing series of glass blowing sculpture vessels formed through the breath to contain smells already created and to be created. With a grant from Paula Krasner Foundation, I have had the privilege last year to be able to work with two professional glass blowers, Esteban Salazar and Joe Abram, in the studios of Urban Glass. This shape of the vessels started from body organs, and in the process, they were able to detach themselves to become smell shelters on their own. From the glass shards, from the manifestations in Rio de Janeiro in 2013, I started June of last year developing a new smell. Creating a new smell from the shards of our present chaotic world and frightening moment is probably a presumption, but it is my act of resistance. To thank Nancy and Tina for the opportunity to be here, and Joseli for your work as inspiration. Um, I work, I write, I draw, I think through images first, and I'm going to show you kind of a response um, to Joseli's work, which I under, was able to see on the internet, and based on Skype conversations, which began last Friday um, <laughs> with Alex and Joseli two hours ahead of New York and Brazil, and three hours behind in, in California. So it's been a really... Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so kind of, I'm going to show you a series of images and begin a set of questions uh, to open up the discussion. Thinking about haptics and taking this as an inspiration from the conference, um, something in discussion with Nancy um, is that we, we were reading a common text of Marinetti's um, uh, Tatelerismo, which is the touch, but we, the, the organizers and, uh, and many of us in the conference, I think all of us, are thinking of that the idea of the haptic is not just the touch. The body reaches out through its skin to touch the world. We receive the world and sense and smells in many different ways. And that's what I've, I've begun to focus on. And really that the haptics is multi-sensory, smell, touch, vision, uh, pressure, um, feelings from inside the body, we can hear the rumblings of our stomach and feel these kind of sensations, both inside and outside. And so you see I'm borrowing some of uh, Joseli's images to begin a kind of my own exploration. And thinking about the sense of smell, the body kind of has all of these exterior kind of conditions, the ear that pr provides this channel into a series of interior chambers, which allow us to both hear, it's about pressure, it's about liquid, it's about balance. Um, the eye is liquid, it's open. It is these kind of places in our bodies 
that, um, that we mediate the world and we cannot always see them. And the sense of smell in, in Joseli's work and the pro provocations that she's providing ask us to think like how, I was thinking, how do, how do we smell? How can we see smell? And she referred to the molecules. And so this is kind of this strange borrowed image of a cross section. Um, I come from architecture and art as well. So thinking, well, what are those shelters in the body? Where is that mediation? And this idea that we have, our, our body mediates this interior chamber, as Joseli explained um, physiologically, that molecules kind of invisible to our eye are brought up deep into the body and then kind of come through the olfactory bulb, change into um, neural and electronic signals that then trigger in the brain, both holding those memories. And I think I'm most, most inspired by her work by she's asking, what is it to create the smell? And we'll, we're going to be talking about that in a bit. So first I just wanted to show you um, the way I work often is I, I draw. And I woke up last Sunday thinking through a series of sketches, kind of furious. I'm not claiming these are beautiful drawings, but they're, wa they're ways I think. So these were the first images that I was thinking about. So here is kind of the nose. I'm thinking of ways one can smell, that image of, of the person leaning into the glass to be able to smell. How do we, we, we sniff, we touch, we probe, we, with our nose, we, we receive the world. So these ideas were, were compelling to me. And then I was thinking about the, the goblets and the, the vases and the shards. I, and I, I worked more perhaps because of my idea of thinking through space. And Joseli and I share undergraduate education in architecture, which is interesting. But thinking about how do you contain, what's contained. And so I'm just going to go through these drawings really quickly. I was thinking, OK, if we have a perfume bottle, some of these, how, how is it applied? Is it something that's volatile oil on the body? Um, I'm thinking of distilling, I'm thinking of glasses, that there's a brandy snifter, there's a way that you, you air red wine. So if you bear me, with me through these, these, these sketches. Um, I also am very interested in the profile of the glass and that if we have a, a regular glass, and I was doing these before I saw the, the, the last pieces, and thinking if one has a profile, you can rotate that, and then you kind of fill that form, right? So I was drawing kind of a half of a glass. And then I was thinking of her, her installation with, with all the different vases and thinking about here's kind of their sit on the shelf. I'll show in a minute. And these are pretty abstract, but I <laughs> this would be if I cut through the bottles and cut through going from the, the, the wider, girthy part that held, holds the, the vessel's balance on a, on, due to gravity on a surface to the top where it gets smaller and smaller through the neck and to the point where I was trying to imagine the molecules flowing and thinking about that dispersion. So um, i come back to that. So these are a little kind of other notes I was thinking, like skin or memory theater of Giulio Camillo and the Renaissance, ways of, of holding memory in different spaces and being able to visit them in the way that you would like. So I was thinking of memory, and that was the conversations that we were having. So I was like, how do you, how do you take those narratives if, if there was a series of glasses? Um, and I kept thinking of other, other kinds of work and ampules and, you know, what happens if there, do we divide the boundary, right? What happens when we all open our, our cards and we are scratching and we end up with this kind of aroma that's the space of the haptic conference, right? And our bodies and what we release. Um, these are sort of, I come back to this image. I was thinking of a, an architect that I write about a lot who did something called Mode Natura, which he was thinking of profiles of Baroque shape. And then I'm jumping, and I'm jumping around, and this is, this is how I begin writing for the most part, um, is responding. So the, kind of an, an idea that inside of a vessel, right, or you, know, you would, like, let's say in the perfume bottle, it's vitreous, it's glass inside so that the, the scent doesn't permeate. I was thinking of permeable vases or permeable glasses that would release or drip or have these scents. And then I was thinking, okay, what happens if you know, kind of the, some of the, the, the ideas about it, the Baroque, like the inside could be kind of separate from the outside, that you could have a separate interior. So I'm, I'm on a riff, right? <laughs> then I was, so this is just to show, and I'm gonna show you, I'm showing the pages as they kind of spilled out of me before I had my coffee, sitting curled up in a chair, which is how I work, and then I kind of like start my day. I sort of see things in the morning. And so I was thinking of in kind of projective geometry when we have complex forms, how one could slice. And I was thinking of her shards. 
Um, I was also thinking of, I was looking at some, reading a lot about geometry and mathematics recently, this idea of a field phenomenon that one could, if I had two points of scent or sound, they're all kind of, it's all ethereal matter that they could spread and they'd intersect. And so I was trying to think, and, and Jocely did throw out to us, well, what is the smell of resistance? And we're gonna come back to that. So these other are just other things I was thinking about with that. So these were the two installations I think that, that, that I, when I was looking through her work, um, was an idea of these contained bottles, but then the presence of these glasses with the shards in the space. And, you know, coming back to that drawing and thinking about the blending. And, and back to those shapes again, which I kind of explained through my sketches. And I think, let's see, I'm very intrigued by these, that, that there's a, a level of discreteness. I was very drawn to the shadows of the glass, the way that the, the light goes through the double layers of the glass and, and kind of have these projections. So I was thinking about both about containment in the individual and the individual scent and the way that the body mediates molecules and creates this memory. Um, so that's what I was, that's in my mind what I saw and tried to sketch, so. And this is highly pixelated, but and really kind of coming to that moment with you know, oxygen masks or ways that we probe space or how so many of our senses, our vital senses to stay alive kind of are you know, diving bells and kind of focus on the head. So some of the, the way that mediation between the scent and how we receive the scent is I think what I'm, I'm drawn to. And then I kind of move laterally through these kind of glass vessels and the alembic and how one would distill and being drawn to some of these images where when, yeah, these are very pixelated, but this idea of a system that the scent is produced from multiple smells then consolidated until they become some other essence that can then, <laughs> it's a great drawing, then be kind of delivered and then it's kind of sent out again. So I went back to Tina and Nancy's um, phrases, and I think Yoseli is on, mon on Monday when we were talking. Um, she was like, okay, I wanna talk about this new scent. How do you create a scent? The smell of resistance. And that, so when I looked back into my work with that provocation and back to the, to the organizer's idea that somehow that we're all here today about hapt hapticity, haptic, the sense of how do we develop the political, I thought that some of the ideas about the, you know, this kind of dispersion, this idea of the mixing, the idea, and I never imagined that I would be standing here in all these like little, all these round tables and everyone's not in, ro in rows, but it's kind of like quite amazing. Um, from up here and just thinking how do we blend, how do we overlap, how do we kind of um, find that scent to what that is and hold that and create that in our memory so that we can act. And so I've been playing with her, her vases and thinking about an extended system of organs, an extended system that one could kind of come and imagining floating this thing in the space and we'd all come to it and somehow this thing can emanate or have us as, as group. And my last slide was back to one of my first sketches where I imagined some, some scent, um, some smell, some a activism developing from the kind of uh, the multiplicity of, of, of voices, smells, ideas, politics, and bodies. So that's where Jocely brought me. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> it's wonderful for me to be here. Um, I have found Josely's work um, deeply stimulating in terms of ways of thinking about the sensual, the haptic, and the sense of smell. So all I'm going to do is offer three different points of ways in which I see her work relating to material in the ancient world, in ancient Greece specifically. So um, I want to start with this wonderful object should I get it into play mode? Would that be better? This wonderful object of Jocelyn's. When we were talking on Skype, she told me that one of her objects was called, she refers to it as the smiley vagina. Is that correct? <laughs> and she told me I would know it when I saw it. So this is it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I want to start with the notion of the smiley vagina. Um, and think about the relationship between smell, women's bodies, that Josie also already has illuminated for us. And think about ways in which the ancient Greeks conceived of the womb, the uterus, the, 
this whole reproductive system for women, it's well known that they thought of the uterus as a kind of upside down jar with a mouth and lips. So we, I was already thinking about the ways in which Joseli's use of vessels in relation to smell could be related to the way the Greeks were thinking of the jar inside the body. Um, but I want to think particularly not so much of, of the womb as a mouth, but rather of, of, of the womb as a nose. This is another way in which, oh, here's just relating to Joseli's work. But so the ancient Greeks thought of the womb as not only a, a kind of upside down jar, but also as a little animal inside the body, right, that moved around and had a very keen sense of smell. And there was ways in which the medical practitioners thought about, you know, if you had a womb that was, you know, hysterical and moving around like an animal around your body, what they would do is put um, a pessary, a strong smelling pessary, a sweet smelling pessary inside the vagina to attract the womb down. So what's really evocative to me about this, what I like about it, is the idea that inside the body we have another, it's not just that the female genitalia falls into that misogynistic trope of, you know, the sight of a bad smell, but also that the womb is an active smeller. And what does it mean to think of a part of a different part of your body that can smell besides the nose, right? Particularly associated with the woman. Also, if you wanted to see if the passage between the vagina and the mouth was free-flowing, was clear in the ancient world, you could put a strong smell inside the vagina, if you're a doctor, and then you would smell the woman's mouth, her breath, and if, um, if it smelled of the object you'd put inside her vagina, you knew her reproductive systems were working properly. So there's kind of interesting correlation going on there between the breath, the mouth, and the vagina that we also see in a different example, which is the oracle, uh, the priestess of the oracle of Apollo at Delphi. So she was known as the Pythia, and she would prophesy, you would come to her and she would prophesy to you, uh, you know, for, through her voice, she would tell you Apollo's prophecy. Um, but it was crucial that she kind of crouched or sat over these strongly smelling vaporous fumes. And the idea was that they would come up, again, her vagina, would, her, her womb would be this kind of actively smelling creature that would take the fumes up and then process them up through the mouth into speech. So again, I want to think about ways in which the female body can, how we can think about smell in relation to Joseli's work with the female body. The second point I wanted to mention was, um, oh, here's some more slides of Joseli's, which I'll, you've already seen. You can think about the vessel and smell. The second point was that the ancients uh, thought very much about the intimate relationship between breath and smell. So smell was something that you um, took up. It, in other words, you couldn't, there was a strong connection between being alive, breathing, and smelling. You can't um, smell without breath, and you can't breathe without smell. Um, so I wanted to think a little bit about this notion of smell being a very haptic experience, something that's really embodied. So, um, you know, Joseli talks about, both about smells as something that exists outside, but also of ways in which they reside inside the body. So when you smell, you are having this immersive, embodied kind of kinetic experience where you are breathing smell and feeling smell inside your body. It's, it's not just something that exists out there. So this kind of alludes to Alicia's work in the sense that Alicia looked at the, the nasal, cav nasal cavities, but also ways in which smell resides within the self, that we carry smell inside us, and it's kind of part of the kind of diaphragm system. Um, in Homer, there's lots of interest. It's, I think this idea between breath and the, the inside and the outside, the gust of wind and the breath of the body is much more strongly related than it is in our own language or culture. So the Greek word pneo, meaning to breathe, right, to breathe in and out, is also the word for a gust of wind. We even have this great example of a warrior in the Iliad who dies, and the wind itself comes in and breathes breath back in. So there's this kind of continuity or equivalence between breath and wind that we find in Homer that also relates to vocabulary. So not only um, the word for breath, but also the word for uh, a gust of wind is also 
the same as the word for smell, and so that the three kind of merge in a way that I think is really interesting and productive to think about. So Jostely's um, housing of smell in these glass nests, glass uh, blown vessels, or sh uh, shards of wine glasses, it seems to me to be particularly kind of um, evocative of the notion of uh, how these containers seem to always ask us to think of smell moving between the inside and the outside, right? What is the permeable barrier between the inside and the outside of the body? And also, how do we contain or house smells? Can we trap them and keep them in, or do they kind of flow into the outside? So the third thing, that the, my last point that was raised to me by Jocely's, um, uh, you know, such interesting material was the relationship between olfaction and articulation. The relationship between language and smell is obviously really integral to your work. Um, so what is the relationship between the smelling nose and the speaking voice? Um, so in your, in your uh, video, uh, New York Through the Nose, one of the things that we see is, you know, people smelling and trying to find vocabulary in which to describe that smell, right? And Joseph, you also already referred to the fact that this is true also of the ancient philosophers would discuss this. There's a very limited vocabulary that we have when it comes to describing smell as opposed to taste, for example. So we have this one idea, start with the smell and trying to find the language to describe it, to capture it. But you also do the complete opposite. You do something, you work in both directions. The other thing that Josely does is she asks us to start with the language, to start with the word, and try to capture the smell. And I think this is just so interesting, trying to think to myself, you know, what does it mean to think, you know, through the mind's nose? To think of a smell when the smell doesn't exist, but to try to conjure it up through imagination or through memory. You know, we, we talk, both of you talked about this a little bit, like, is that actually possible, right? So this whole question of, um, Oh, I forgot, yes, forget that slide, I kind of forgot it. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> so this whole question of what the smell of resistance, for example, might smell like, you know, how can we even begin to find, to find the smells in our minds? How can we begin to imagine a smell just starting from a word? And I, I just found this, just, you know, the difference between having the smell of resistance pumped into this room <laughs> versus us all in our minds kind of bringing it together, whether that's all of the molecules of our thoughts that come together as a kind of smell, or our independent different ones. I mean, Josephine gives us this interesting vocabulary to think with. She uses adjectives like open, hot, <coughs> wet, or she uses abstract nouns like emptiness, illusion, resistance, affection, as a way to try to help us kind of bridge that cognitive gap between language and smell. And so I think one of the things we wanted to just end with was going back to your final question, which is, you know, what is the smell of resistance? Can we dream it? Can we imagine it? How could we begin to articulate it? Right? So I think that's where we'd want to end. Yeah. Um, and after that, completely wonderful um, end to end technology. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> well, rising above the, that moment of rising above technology and that absolutely beautiful presentation um, and your wonderful responses, um, we now want to bring you all into the conversation. So I have a, I have. Thank you so much for all of the um, all of the presentations. Um, I was struck by um, the last in the last comment that you made about the relationship between going from a word to a smell to something like resistance, which is linking a word to a sensory response to action, right, in a lot of ways, or at least some form of agency. Um, but something happened at our table <laughs> that was really, really interesting, which was that, so we have the smell of emptiness and the smell of affection. And um, Carla had the smell of emptiness and I had the smell of affection. And we both smelled them and we, you know, responded to those. And then we swapped. And Carla can't smell, can't pick up affection at all. And emptiness, I can't have near me because it's too intense. Um, I mean, literally, I'm, I'm, I'm very smell sensitive. 
And so I just wanted to actually think through that combination with you about some people's receptivities to some affective intensities of smell. And at the same time, so for me, it's like, you know, emptiness, I literally had to push it away. Um, so just to, to have you talk a little bit about, is that intentional? Have you encountered it? But what does it mean about us thinking about effective responses and in fact, effective um, investments in sensory um, interactions? Yeah, well, what a smell, everyone smells differently. Nobody smells the same thing. So uh, uh, we also have a lot of uh, certain blocks that we may be able to smell certain things and not other things. So it, it, in a way, the, the research, as we know, I mean, we, just in 2004, we had uh, that uh, couple, which was uh, uh, Linda Buck, and uh, I think Richard or Robert, they're from Columbia University, that got the Nobel Prize in finding, in they were researching um, how many thousands of smells we can smell. And so we're talking about a very, very new uh, scientific research and very little known. And I think it has a lot to do with what we spoke in terms of uh, early on, we, I mean, uh, the, the culprits are Plato and, uh, and Kant and uh, they are the ones that stop it us to smell. <laughs> and so Nobel Prize came very late. So I, I, it doesn't happen with other senses. No? So I think this is a question that's, I don't know how to answer, I mean, how people, because that becomes already into neuroscience, which is fabulous, very interesting. And we have also the other thing, it's interesting how um, there is also vibration and uh, in terms of the smell. So there are certain molecules that uh, I use it, the same molecules I use it in completely two different smells, and they're both the same drawing of these molecules, but they are different smells, completely different smells. So there is a, uh, a crazy guy called Luca Turin, um, an Italian that, um, I think he, he had a, um, a professorship in, in London, and I think they asked him to leave, and this is a while ago, about maybe 10 years ago, and he wrote about, uh, um, this, um, how, not the volume, but uh, how would you say about uh, the, um, the difference, it, it really has to do with uh, um, how sound moves. And in that explain also um, how the smells can have the same molecules and also, so these vibrations, are very new. I think there is a study coming out. I would love to meet uh, these two neuroscientists at Rockefeller University. And maybe I'll have a chance because they are working with vibration. And now look at him that was a crazy guy. Now he's getting to be uh, in. So it, it's very confusing this. I think very difficult to know, but it's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> Thank you, that was so great. Um, and I, I have so many things that I'm thinking about now. Uh, so I'll, I'll just pick a couple. I, I, one thing I was thinking about is work that's been done recently on um, smell and sexual attraction. I mean, so I, an area that I didn't hear you talk much about specifically is that notion that the, the smell, people are attracted, people know the right person by their smell, right? It is the unlying feature of a human that makes you know which is the other human for you. And they've actually, there are studies <laughs> where some women were, were told to smell, I think, sweaty t-shirts of different men. Okay. And um, oddly enough, the women who were, who were not on hormonal birth control um, smelled correctly, which <laughs> meant in the study that they smelled, they liked the smells of the t-shirts of men whose immunodeficiencies were non-matching with theirs, yeah. su suggesting that they were, they were you know, genetically picking the right guy. Um, and so that's interesting and kind of bizarre, 
But I think it also reflects something about the another aspect of the way we think of smell as working in our lives, which is about being drawn to somebody in some kind of animalistic way that Plato would hate. You know, but that is like an honest, earthy truth, right? That that's part of how we experience the world. Um, and so that's one thing. And then on another, on a flip side, there's there are also revolting smells, right? There's the smell of that that brings disgust. And it seems to me that a lot of the history of smell is trying to cover up and exclude those smells, right? And that, that also brings, uh, it has a lot to do with the way we experience the world um, in different classes, right? Where can, you, where can you exclude smells? Who gets to exclude certain smells? Um, how does a homeless person smell? How does a wealthy person smell? Um, it seems like that, that must be a very um, Im sort of important part of how that mediates our interaction with the world. Um, I don't know if that's a, que a question mark. Well, I, let me just mention uh, one thing in terms of the bad smells and the foul smells. It, it's interesting because uh, uh, for me to be able to develop the smells, um, it has been through this company, through this Givauda, that I don't know how it happened, but it happened, this encounter, and so I became a, a pet for them. And it's fabulous, because otherwise I would never be able to do anything. Um, but at the same time, it's at this time now, I'm working in, this, in the smell of resistance since last June. Usually it takes about a couple of years, a year, a couple of years to really get into the stop, the develop of the smell. And, uh, um, and at this time, I'm working with a perfumist the other times I was working with technicians. I don't know what it means, if I got up a higher up with them, or I have no idea, but that's what they assign it for me. And um, it's been very difficult to bring it in, a foul smell in the resistance. Obviously, I want the putrecina, I want uh, the cadaverina, I'm talking about uh, uh, the burning tires, I'm talking about fire, the composition of body. I mean, uh, we're not going to, to do a smell that will be just uh, pleasant or possible to smell. No, in certain areas, certain layers of this smell, it's going to be very repulsive because this is what uh, it happens for us, what's going on with the world and what we have to do to resist. And um, so it, they are having a lot of difficulties. And they, he even told me, I don't have this, this here in, the, in my library of smells. I said, go get it, because uh, we needed to do it. So it, it's, for me, it's been interesting. And the smell of nest, which was the first one I made it in 2009, 2010. Um, was too sweet for me. But I was very kind of shy. I said, my gosh, I mean, I, I know nothing about smell. I have a chutzpah to really be here with, uh, in the laboratory and telling them I like or don't, I want this, that, and that. And uh, um, I think it was, got very sweet. And I accepted because of shyness and lack of confidence. And uh, now I ask them, I said, look, I want, I'm going to do smell of nest too. And I'm taking all that uh, sweetness out. <laughs> because uh, it almost like it, this, it be, now that I went to Dubai a couple of years ago to talk about smell, and I was, the smell there was really <coughs> incredible because they hide their own smell constantly. And it was very interesting as you're talking about the, the smell, the body smell, um, when I would go through those gigantic uh, shopping centers, right? And uh, each store had a different smell, but they want heavy stuff. And it's that corny smell, that mushy, um, that nauseates you a little. And, um, and at the same time, would come a man and would pass. He didn't need to do this. He was just passing. Wow. That was what you're talking about. I mean, that smell was incredible. 
and that was real. And while everything around, uh, they were hiding. You know? So uh, um, I don't know how I got into Dubai, but uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? Yes, what, it just Your comments pointed out how clearly smell is gendered. So the, the technicians were trying to make nest a sweet smell because they were thinking perhaps of nest being something feminine. Whereas he was like, well, why does it have to be, why does, you know, why is it okay for masculine smell to be sweaty, strong, and feminine to be, has to be sweet? And so I think that's, that mm -hmm. you're just unpacking an, an interesting dimension of what we think of ways in which yeah. smell is gendered. We have to stop soon, but I'm, I'm uh, going to take advantage of my role as organizer to ask a question. So uh, this is kind of for all three of you. Um, and I, it's the smell of nests that got my head going, but also the weird Aristotle quote, because why in the world would he think he knew how animals smelled? Um, and then, then moving to Alicia's um, uh, image of the cross-section of the smell um, in our heads. Uh, so do, um, do animal cross-sections look like that? Is that you know, is that part of what is, is going on there? But the, I mean, I'm not, uh, that's more of a positivistic question. What I'm really interested in is um, our, our human presumption, right, about our special capacity to smell relating to our breath and life and therefore our life force and our humanness, right, some, some, something around that um, and how smell of nest relates to that. Briefly about the Aristotle quote, which um, so Aristotle believes that all animals have a sense of smell, but for example, he talks about fish smelling underwater, but they couldn't inhale without, you know, because fish, I don't exactly know how fish work, but um, <laughs> Aristotle says, you know, if they inhaled, they would obviously choke, they don't have a breathing apparatus in that same sense. So the quote is interesting because he really wants to single out. Um, inhalation is peculiar to man. It's, mankind is unique in the sense that we smell differently. And I mean, that I haven't like, done more research on it, but I find it very interesting that he wants to separate, just as you said, this notion of and other, all life creatures smell, but we, there's something special about our liveliness through smell. Um, I don't really have much to add to that, except I find it interesting, yeah. Just a really quick comment. It was so beautiful to see um, not only your work, but to hear um, the generosity of, uh, of the two of you engaging with it. I just, um, maybe to throw this in for the continuing day on the question of synesthesia, because I, I have a color smell synesthesia, so smell has always been complicated for me. And I've been collaborating with autistics for many years now, and I just wanted to read a short passage by one of them his name is uh, Tito Mukhopadhyay, and he's, uh, he's if you, if you want to read his work, he's a non-speaking autistic, but we've just published uh, one of his books. He's 25, isn't it? And uh, you can find it for free on the Humanities, uh, Open Humanities Press. But I just thought, I think you'll, you'll see the relevance. So this is um, <clears throat> when uh, I was asking him, there was a mining accident in Texas about 10 years ago, and I was asking him, about the mining accident, and y y perhaps it's important to know, if you don't know this, that often autistics are accused of not being relational. It's, it's, it's completely wrong, but, um, but part of um, their account of the misunderstandings of relationality are about the senses, that, that neurotypicals have a tendency to perceive the senses as sense organs rather than as relations, and so Tito says, um, I, so he's been watching um, the news on TV. He says, I see these stories sometimes in vermilion or indigo, the richness depending upon the intensity of the stories. Sometimes they smell like vitriol and sometimes they smell like boiling starch in a pot of clay. And sometimes they have the essence of the twilight sky. As I feel my worries for the trapped coal miners, I can smell the boiling starch frothing on the brim of the clay pot, and then spilling out with the smell of burning rice. My worries grow as the voice of the newsreader continues to say that the miners are still trapped. I smell burning rice spread across the room as more starch spills out. My body begins to itch as though tiny black tickle ants have been set free from a box. They can smell the burning rice from the spilling starch, and they rush around to find the source with a collective ant hunger. 
My worry now accumulates in and across my itching skin as the voice of the newsreader comes from far away like a blue floating balloon. I have no hold on it because it floats away, leaving me with itchy skin. So I want to thank you for reading that, and I also want to ask everyone to join us in uh, thanking our panelists for this conversation.